So today I'm going to talk about why I think you should become a glass scientist. And uh, I have a reason for wanting to convince you of that, which you'll find out at the end of the talk. So here we go. So I, in the beginning of the talk, I'm going to show a few slides about glass as you know it, glass that we all interact with today. So you can see this slide, for example. There are windows. There are chandeliers. There's a glass table over here. There's a couple of martini glasses, the glass that you guys all know and have been interacting with all your lives. Here's another one, the windows of your car. Probably sit in cars a lot of the day as you go back and forth between home and school. And you're familiar with automotive glass. And of course, we drink out of glasses too, and we are doing that right now. I'll be doing it in a few minutes ago. So that's the kind of glass that has existed for a long time. And uh, it's all the same kind of glass, actually. Same composition. Now I'm going to show you some things about glass that you may or may not know, depending on how much you've been around Corning Incorporated. Uh, so this is a kind of glass that's used to transmit light. It's called optical fiber, which you probably know. And this spool, for example, I don't know how much is on there, but hundreds and hundreds of kilometers of optical fiber can be on one spool like that. And these fibers are just you know, a couple hundred microns in diameter. And so that's just a few human hairs wide. And they transmit uh, you know, millions and millions of pieces of data per second, billions actually. So this is a special kind of glass that's very different from the first uh, three slides, right? This glass is, first of all, flexible. You can bend it. You can actually wrap it around a pencil. It's that flexible. And it's really, really pure. It's so pure that light can go through it for you know, a couple hundred kilometers in some cases without needing to be amplified. Very different from the, from the glass you saw in the first couple slides. This is another example of a type of glass that's different. Uh, this is glass that's used in electronics. Uh, principally, it's used in displays, and there are two kinds of glass used in displays. One is the flat, the super flat glass that's used in liquid crystals. And the other kind is the cover glass that you probably have heard of uh, on smaller devices. And Corning has a product called Gorilla Glass, which I have a few samples of in the back if you want to try to break one uh, at the end of the talks today. But this glass is also very different. It's highly engineered to be perfectly flat, dimensionally stable, and the Gorilla Glass is engineered to be strong. There's another kind of special glass. This is glass that's used in the cameras that are used to make computer chips. And these lenses have to be huge. They have to transmit ultraviolet radiation. They have to be free of inhomogeneities. They have to be free of bubbles. And they're very highly engineered types of glass. And finally, we have glasses that are used to explore the universe. Uh, first, we make mirrors out of glass that have to have special thermal properties so that they don't crack when they get hot and cold. And we have uh, even, the, even the windows of the space shuttle are made out of a special kind of glass that doesn't crack or break. That would be really bad, actually, if you're in the space shuttle, so it's a special kind of glass. And then in the future, we expect other forms of glass and types of glass to be important. One of them is for generating energy. This is a picture of the solar panel. And the glass that the solar panels are made on has to be a special kind of glass that's made to, so that the solar panels will have the highest efficiency. Finally, some of you may have seen these uh, videos that Corning has released in the recent years, the day made of glass videos, uh, where it sort of describes what we think the future of glass could be, including things like ubiquitous displays, where we've got all of the surfaces in your life will suddenly become displays, the mirrors in your bathroom. The wall of your classroom could be a big piece of glass that has a display on it that you can use to interact with and teach with. And in your car, there will be other surfaces made out of glass. And that's sort of like the future of how glass is going to be important to our lives. So. Uh, 
what I've shown here is basically that there are two kinds of glass. There's what I call normal glass, or everyday glass, which the windows, the drinking glasses, the car windows, that are part of your everyday life. They're all basically one kind of glass composition called soda lime glass. And it's gotten to the point where that kind of glass is made in, you know, tons and tons a day, millions of tons probably. Uh, and it's sort of like a commodity. But the glasses that are really creating our future are all these specialty glasses that consist of many different compositions, and they're not really combined. They're special, they're engineered for a certain purpose. And I'm getting to the point where I want to convince you to become a glass scientist, so hang on. So when you design a glass, what you're basically doing is choosing the elements that the glass is made out of. Most glasses have silica in them, which is, comes from sand, but they also have alumina in them. They have calcium in them sometimes, they have boron in them, they have sodium sometimes, potassium, they contain all these different elements, and you get those elements by melting raw materials that are dug out of the earth. And what you're trying to do when you design a glass, and this is what my group does at Corning, is you're trying to design it to have certain properties. Some applications need very high transparency, like the optical fiber. Some of them have to have engineered thermal expansion so that they don't crack when they get hot or cold, so low expansion glasses. Uh, some of them have to be very dimensionally stable, like a display glass. It has to be exactly the same size. After you heat it up and cool it back down, it has to come back to the same exact dimensions, and it has to not warp. Uh, then there's strength. If you're gonna be protecting the front of an electronic device, the glass has to be strong because it's gonna be touched a lot. And all these properties are engineered by the atoms that we put in the glass. And it's a very complicated subject, how you come up with combinations of elements that produce the properties you want. It's not simple at all, and we still only understand a little bit of how we come up with glass compositions. So we really need a lot of help still to understand the chemistry of the glass, the properties of the glass. There are, in addition, other properties we really care about that have nothing to do with the end use, but they're related to how you will manufacture the glass. What's the viscosity of the glass? How gooey is it? How drippy is it? Um, and how quickly does it cool down so that when you're working it into a shape, it doesn't harden on you, because if it hardens, you, you can't finish it. You know? So these, these are the properties that we're aiming for when we design compositions. Now, uh, this is where you're going to come in, I hope. Uh, we still have a lot of problems to solve in glass science and in glass properties. We, as you probably know, and I think it actually happened here, you know, glass still breaks. It still breaks, and it is one of the reasons people don't use glass for things. It's because they're worried it's going to break. So how to make glass unbreakable? We're still working on it. We don't have a solution. Today, even the strongest girl of glass will still break if you try hard enough. Although, I'd like to see you try back there, because <laughs> it's very strong. Uh, how to make glass conduct electricity, that's another amazing thing. You know glass is an insulator, uh, generally speaking, that's what people think. Could we make it conduct electricity? And if we did, what amazing things could we do with glasses that conducted electricity? We also want to try to make glass conduct either a lot of heat, for certain reasons, or in some cases, no heat. We'd love to make windows that don't leak heat out into the air, so that in wintertime we wouldn't have to have double and triple pane windows. We just have a single window that's a good thermal barrier against the cold. That doesn't exist today. And we're interested in a whole bunch of other more creative things, uh, like can you make a glass that lets air through it, but not water? Because that would also be a really interesting glass for a window. You could have fresh air coming into a building, but you don't want the water to come into buildings. And uh, that's, that's just an idea. No one knows how to do that, but if you become a glass scientist someday, we hope you can help work on it. One of the ones I didn't put up here, which I should have listed, is how to come up with a glass that doesn't show fingerprints. Because as you probably know, the minute you touch a piece of glass, there's fingerprints on it. There are different ways to clean it off. But what we really love is no fingerprints. That'd be amazing. So going back to the theme of creativity, you have to be creative and think about the things that might be possible with glass, but people usually don't think of because they're used to thinking of glass a certain way. You have to break the boundaries and be creative to be a glass scientist. So if you're creative and you're interested in technology and chemistry, consider it. Okay, here's the uh, 
next to last slide. The fact is, um, I'm actually concerned about it because there aren't enough people studying glass science. If you look at all the universities in the United States, for example, where glass science has been taught, the number of courses is declining, the number of professors is declining, they retire and no one replaces them. And students in general aren't going into glass science, and so the universities kind of know about it, the government agencies who fund it know about it, but companies like Corning are really worried about it because pretty soon, 10, 15, 20 years from now, we will not have anybody to hire. And all of the things you can do with glass, or that we think you might want to do with glass, need to be invented by somebody. Someone has to get in and learn about glass and figure out how those things can be done and we need people to study glass science. So please uh, take that to heart. And I'd leave you with the, the, the statement on the slide, glass is creating the future. There are really great careers in glass science and it's a fascinating subject that hardly anybody knows Thank you.